Welcome to The Real News Network. I'm Sharmini Perez coming to you from Baltimore. On Tuesday, the Iraqi government agreed to a long-term accord with the autonomous Kurdish re region to share the country's oil wealth and military resources. Both parties and the U.S. are hoping that this will help reunite the country in the face of a bitter war against the IS. With us to discuss the agreement and what it will mean for Iraq is Antonio Yuhas. She's joining us from San Francisco. Antonia Yuhas is an oil and energy analyst, author, and journalist. She is the author of three books on the oil industry, including The Tyranny of Oil, and most recently, Black Tide, The Devastating Impact of the Gulf Oil Spill. Thank you so much for joining us, Antonia. Thank you so much for having me. So, Antonia, tell us about this new agreement between the Kurds and the Iraqi government. Yeah, this is a, a very uh, important agreement, um, both for what has been agreed to and what's been left unsaid um, in terms of what the deal includes. And there's, in fact, been very little said on what the deal includes. Um, probably important to note that it's actually an interim agreement that still needs to be ratified. It's part of the negotiations for Iraq's 2015 budget. And so this deal is part of that budget process, which still needs to be ratified um, by the rest of the Iraqi government, but it's still a very substantial agreement. And what happened is that the Kurdistan regional authorities, so the Kurdistan, uh, the Kurdistan regional government, excuse me, the KRG, agreed with the central Iraqi government that the Kurds would start sending 550,000 barrels of oil per day from the central Iraqi government, I mean, sorry, from the Kurdistan region to the central Iraqi government for the Iraqis to sell. And in return, the Kurds would get 17% of Iraq's um, budget, which is what they are supposed to be getting under deals agreed to through negotiations over the constitution and implementing the Iraqi constitution, in addition to what will total to about a billion dollars for funds to support the Kurds military, which is called the Peshmerga, their own military arm. And this ends, well, actually years of standoffs that have gotten particularly worse in the last couple of months between the central Iraqi government refusing to give the Kurds their fair share of the budget and the Kurds increasingly producing their own oil and not turning any of the oil or the proceeds of the oil over to the central government, which is part of an even older, longer term struggle between the Kurdish regional government, which wants ultimately hopes for independence completely from Iraq and the central Iraqi government that wants to maintain um, its not only uh, uh, relationship with the Kurds, but its control over their decision making, their oil, um, and keep them as part of the uh, central Iraq. Antonia, you who have been following this issue for a very, very long time, um, both this new government in Iraq and this uh, forced relationship between the Kurdish region uh, and the central government, and and now this oil agreement all seems to be a bit forced. Uh, so from your experience, do you think this is going to work? Well, you know, what you have is um, the Kurds that want to be independent. They need their oil to be independent. And what they also need is the support of other countries. And one of the countries that they really hoped would support that independence is the United States with its military. And at the end of the day, it is much better from a U.S. perspective and particularly from a U.S. oil company perspective that there is stability and peace between these two regions. And I think ultimately that these two regions stay together as one because any real effort for independence would undoubtedly lead to even greater instability in this region, even more hostility, even more violence, throwing a lot of oil um, up in the air in terms of being able to produce that oil. So the U.S. government has worked for a very long time to try and support, I think, unity between the two regions, even though sometimes in public there have been calls for an independent Kurdistan supported by the U.S. government. I actually don't think that's been the real position of the government. I think that's been more of a threat um, to the central Iraqi government to play ball with the Kurds or the U.S. government will side with the Kurds um, for independence. And 
there is a lot of oil in Kurdistan, and the Kurds have used that oil as a lever to try and keep the United States on their side. And what they've done is where throughout the U.S. invasion of Iraq that began in the one that began in 2000, 2003, of course, we've had, we've had several, um, is that the Bush administration fought very hard to get Iraq to radically open up its oil industry to foreign oil companies. The central Iraqi government did that somewhat, but the Kurds did it all the way. They implemented the dream um, laws that the U.S. government and oil companies have admitted that they drafted, which are sort of the best deals that a foreign oil company could get. And the Kurds implemented those type of contracts as a way to get the support of the U.S. military and U.S. oil companies, and they have had that. So in the current iteration of the U.S. Uh, war in Iraq, when Obama started airstrikes, those airstrikes began at a very particular moment. It's when Islamic State was threatening Kurdistan, was threatening oil holdings in Kurdistan and threatening the Kurds. That's when the airstrikes began. Those airstrikes pushed back uh, Islamic State from this region, and those airstrikes supported the Kurds. But I believe that the Obama administration also then said, you know, look, you guys have to work this out. We don't want to see um, an independent, a, a military conflict between the Kurds and the central Iraqi government and put pressure on the two sides to work out a deal. And I think ultimately that deal works uh, at, at the most to the interests of the Kurds and also uh, the most to the interests of, of U.S. and other Western oil companies and the U.S. government. Right. Antonia, you mentioned uh, the war against IS, and we know that um, this is really also a battle for oil because the IS is largely financed by the illegal oil um, exports. Uh, their revenue is dependent on that. Now, how much of the oil fields and oil refineries are at this point under the control of the IS? Yeah, I mean, we're not... So the, the U.S. government is certainly interested in keeping Islamic State from taking oil. But the oil that Islamic State has, has taken thus far is not any um, you know, sizable fields or fields that had previously belonged to U.S. companies. Um, Islamic State has taken fields in Syria, which, if you go way back, actually did belong um, to Shell and Francis Total, but that's pretty far back. Um, Islamic State took over those fields. It's taken over some smaller fields in Iraq in the north, and it is producing oil from those fields. Um, this is low-tech um, low tech production and small fields. It's then refining uh, much of that crude in, again, very low-tech, almost backyard refineries, and then using very old uh, and pre-existing smuggling networks to smuggle the fuel or the oil, depending on which form it's in, out of Iraq or Syria, and to make money through those smuggling networks. And then from those networks, the oil uh, is sold into the global marketplace, or the fuel is just simply used by people who need the fuel. And Islamic State is also using the fuel um, to sell directly and make money from the sale of that fuel and to use for its own purposes. And through these channels, uh, with the oil being smuggled out of Turkey, Jordan, Syria, um, the Islamic State has been estimated to have made as much as $2 million per day, which makes it the best funded terrorist organization in history. Um, but that seems to be whittled down now to probably more like a million a week, but which is still a huge amount of money. And it is the primary source of income for Islamic State. Now, very different from Al Qaeda which received the vast majority of its funds from foreign benefactors, primarily from Saudi Arabia, Islamic State is financially independent. It makes its money from the sale of oil, ransoms, and extortion, which keeps it um, independent. But I would argue also because there's very clear funding streams that you can see on the ground, and there's been very good reporting on this topic, um, on the ground from outlets as diverse as you know, the Wall Street Journal, the New York Times, the Guardian of London, who've tracked these smuggle networks, they're very well known. And that also means that they could be non-militarily targeted. So you could shut them down, I would argue, through simple 
police actions, and also you can track the money. Eventually, that money is ending up in a bank account somewhere. So the U.S. Treasury Department last month launched an attack, uh, if you will, a financial attack trying to target that oil money, which is great, but it shouldn't come. It shouldn't have come after the bombing, and it certainly shouldn't be coupled with bombing. If you could target this money um, and these resources for Islamic State non-militarily and have that be part of a diplomatic solution to this problem, not a continuation of the military uh, approach. Right. Antonio, that's large sums of oil being smuggled, uh, as well as, you know, money being um, gained from it. Uh, how would the U.S. government actually track that kind of money if they were to follow the money? Well, you know, eventually, like I said, it's ending up in somebody's bank account. So the money, right, you know, it's initially done through cash. This is a, you know, cash-based exchange, um, but that cash ends up somewhere. So, um, you know, they pay the truckers who smuggle the money out, and those truck companies have to, um, or the, the people who own the trucks have to pay um, insurance at some point. They have to put the money in a bank account somewhere at some time, and those financial networks can be traced. What's needed uh, and what thus far seems to be missing is really the support of the Turkish government in shutting down this network. And you've got to remember this is an area, as surprising as this is, to most people, it's an enormous it's an area, immensely wealthy in oil, but with very little fuel within Iraq, uh, within Turkey, uh, within Syria, because so much of the products are exported out, particularly in Iraq, where over 80% of the oil is exported out of the country. There's very little refining capacity, but also um, that oil is being exported out to make money and, and to make money for foreign companies as well as the government. And so just the need for fuel is very um, desperate among populations within um, domestically, as well as then making more money by exporting that oil out. You can track um, what we've seen is newspaper outlets, um, really great groups like um, Brookings, the Brookings Institute in Doha that have got people who have been on the ground who've tracked these networks. And people have been tracking these networks, by the way, these, this smuggling of oil um, out of Iraq through these networks has been happening since at least 2005 by insurgent groups, including um, the predecessors to Islamic State. So I think these networks are fairly well known and fairly well identifiable. There just has to be the will um, to shut them down and to do it non-militarily. Uh, right. It would be easy for the U.S. to actually target the, these uh, routes uh, and bomb them. But I understand that's not very advisable, since we don't know who's actually driving those trucks, whether they are IS members or just ordinary Iraqi uh, citizens. Um, well, I mean, there's that. But there's also, you know, first of all, people need the fuel. Right? They need the fuel. They need the oil. Right now, this is, uh, you know, Local people need the fuel, the places where the fuel is going, they need the fuel. So whoever bombs it is going to just create more animosity. If you bomb refineries, if you bomb fields, which we have done already, if you bomb trucks, you're just going to build more animosity against the United States and more support of Islamic State to try and drive out what's perceived as the U.S. government in Iraq. Um, and also, this is fuel. It's oil. If you bomb it, it creates a real environmental problem. And I don't think that's a good idea either. It's bad for goodwill. Um, it's bad for the use, the people who need the use of the fuel and the oil. And it's bad for the environment. And we have a host of di diplomatic solutions that are possible against Islamic State. Um, and the more that we bomb the, anything, the more that we make diplomatic uh, solutions more difficult to come by. Right. And finally, Antonia, what are some of those solutions? Well, we need to um, work with partners that we haven't been as inclined to work with. Um, Phyllis Bennis from the Institute for Policy Studies has done a wonderful job of going through in detail uh, excellent diplomatic solutions. Um, so what I'm going to borrow is a lot of her analysis. But that includes working with Iran to get Iran to put pressure on the Shia government of Iraq to create a more inclusive government that embraces Sunnis. If they don't do that, then this, these problems are going to spill over into Iran, and Iran doesn't want that to happen. Um, we need to work much better and more closely with the Turks and figure out what the Turks need so that they can help us shut down um, networks, both of fighters coming in and oil coming out. We need to help create um, an end to the civil war in Syria. 
um, a, a huge influx of goodwill from the United States working with um, countries like Iran, countries like Russia, would help uh, create the will to end the civil war in Syria and a push for humanitarian aid. There's a great need for humanitarian aid throughout Iraq, but we're not doing that. We're sending in bombs instead. And all of that, you know, pulling ourselves out militarily helps, I think, reduce the pressure on the Sunnis to see enemies coming from every side of them, um, pushing them to side with Islamic State and support Islamic State. The less that Islamic State is supported, the less it can take over land, the less it can take over resources, and has to keep withdrawing and withdrawing and withdrawing. And if we targeted their oil money, what they would no longer have are the funds that they're using to pay. They're, they pay uh, you know, $500 a week to people to fight on their behalf. If they don't have that money, they want the soldiers. If they don't have the soldiers, they can't take over land. If they can't take over land, they can't build a state, et cetera, et cetera. So I think it's quite possible. Um, none of it's easy, none of it's short term. But I think every day that we address this problem militarily, the more and more difficult the diplomatic solutions become. Right. Antonia, we love having you on The Real News. So please do come back real soon. Thanks. Thanks for having me. And thank you for joining us on The Real News Network.